Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. More than anything, uh, African uh, nations uh, or African people need their sovereignty to be respected. Uh, these were the words of Dr. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Ndong while participating uh, in uh, the uh, Berlin uh, Foresight Summit that uh, uh, took place uh, in Germany 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of the program. It is views on the continent on the Pan-African television. Today we continue to look at uh, uh, global issues. We continue to look at how the situations in the world are affecting uh, the trends across Africa. And of course, today we are looking at uh, Africa's uh, uh, 2040 uh, strategy that was outlined uh, in 2019 uh, during uh, a foresight session in Berlin, Germany, to discuss, of course, how can they can fast track growth and development across Africa. But then uh, we are looking at how we can analyze uh, to see the feasibility of this uh, uh, Africa Vision 2040 with uh, the uh, changing trends which have occurred in uh, Africa from 2019 till now in prelude uh, to the uh, second Africa Russia uh, summit uh, slated for July 2023. Stakeholders both from Africa and Russia have started galvanizing resources to ensure that the summit actually does not end just with discussions but to see the full implementation of the sessions arrive at the next uh, international parliamentary uh, conference to russia africa which is built uh, uh, for this March 2023, uh, and of course, uh, the one that was conducted in uh, 2019 and the 2019 still Berlin Foresight uh, Summit are some of the uh, events uh, that are giving impetus to the uh, relationship between uh, Russia and Africa. And of course, uh, with the changes that have occurred across the globe, uh, seeing uh, a search in geopolitics and uh, also in geoeconomic it is very imperative to relook uh, Africa uh, 2040 strategy uh, that was presented at the first uh, um, at the Berlin Foresight Summit and of course uh, presented at the uh, the Russia Africa Economic Forum and to look how this can be adjusted to meet the changing times uh, Africa 2040 agenda highlighted areas like uh, sovereignty uh, monetary policy energy electricity governance, education, and uh, culture. It is therefore utmost to discuss this Africa's 2040 uh, strategy on development and see how new perspectives can be defined amid global changes. It is imperative uh, to discuss or to take a look uh, at the uh, Africa 2040 uh, strategy and of course see the adjustment that needs to be made as far as uh, the agenda or the strategy is concerned that is advocating for uh, practical growth and development across Africa. How can we adjust it to meet uh, the changing times and of course uh, the changing trends across uh, the continent africa welcome once more ladies and gentlemen if you are just joining us this is views on the continent on the pan-african television african media it is uh, uh, informative as well as interactive so today we are f uh, focusing on uh, the uh, uh, 20 africa 2040 uh, strategy and how the global situation 
situations in uh, the world uh, affecting uh, African uh, trains. Uh, joining me is the, the uh, a panel of experts to give highlight or insight on this very important uh, topic that is coming in prelude to the second Africa or Russia Africa summit slated for July 2023. 20, uh, 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 we delight to, of, of course, introduce the panel to you, uh, starting by acknowledging the presence of uh, Yulia Burke, a uh, political scientist, joining us this day to brainstorm on, on this very important uh, topic. Hello to you, uh, Yulia Burke, and thanks for joining us this day. To be here, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for always making out time to be with us. And I think we are going to the United Kingdom this time around uh, to meet uh, Mr. Clinton Ellis. He's a geopolitical analyst, geostrategist, and of course, electrical power engineer. It's a pleasure having you this day on the Pan-African television, Mr. Ellis. Hi, Clarice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon uh, to all the viewers. I'm very, very um, privileged to be here to discuss this very, very important um, salient issue and to bring more clarity so that we can all come together and make this happen. <laughs> It is very important or imperative to discuss, of course, uh, constructively to see how uh, Africa can up the game as far as international cooperation is concerned. We'll also be joined uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Enwako, uh, joining us in his capacity as a researcher uh, with Leeds University on African uh, development. Uh, if you're there, you're most welcome, Mr. Enwako. He will be joining us uh, subsequently. We are going to kick off uh, with you, uh, Yulia Burke. Today we are looking at uh, the uh, Africa 2040 strategy, and of course looking at how the global changes or the changes that have occurred in uh, the world in recent times are actually affecting uh, this uh, uh, vision or strategy uh, uh, that was well defined uh, uh, in uh, 2019 uh, following the, the Berlin Foresight Summit. Uh, 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 summit. Uh, in your perspective, let's get a holistic view of, of this uh, Agenda 2040, what it's all about, its objectives, and of course see how we can uh, discuss to, to, to meet uh, the, uh, the changing times. Well, um, in the first place, I would like to say a couple of words about the, the strategy that we are about to discuss. So the document mentioned, the uh, Africa 2040 strategy was actually put together um, as a result of a series of expert talks and conversations. And it was a result of uh, much work, including the, uh, uh, the Berlin um, event uh, that you mentioned. And I think it's very symbolic that uh, the work on this uh, document itself, on its strategy, with participation of uh, experts uh, from Africa, was taking place uh, specifically in Berlin, because the previous well-known uh, Berlin conference was the exact opposite. It's, it was about divide and conquer, while this event was all about uh, unite and, and uh, make prosper, right? So. That was uh, the approach uh, being used. Then there were, there was quite a lot of, uh, let's say, cabinet work uh, conducted, and uh, Clifton Ellis, pre present here, has also put a lot of efforts into uh, uh, writing this document and and uh, uh, basically uh, putting together the uh, expert opinions, the results of discussions, and his own research. So it's a very uh, vivid thing, and it's something that emanated as a result of uh, multiple expert conversations with the people who know the situation really well. But what could not have been uh, foreseen in details back in 2019 was that we would have uh, uh, very significant global catalyzing factors that uh, are making us uh, drop some of the um, illusions and be very practical about uh, the future paths and the future partnerships that can contribute to uh, development and contribute to cooperation because uh, the uh, the situations at the global arena that we are observing now definitely do help us to be quick in, in uh, having the masks uh, falling off and understanding 
who's promoting what kind of a um, of an agenda, right? So, as we could see, how fast the pandemic masks uh, fell off once the uh, global situation has changed, we will see a lot of other masks dropping, and this lays perfect foundations for sovereignty. As you mentioned, it's one of the key topics uh, um, uh, discussed in the document, right? And uh, there should be no um, illusions, but there should be freedom to choose partnerships. It, there should be freedom to define um, own strategies, and there should be freedom to uh, deal with own um, issues and make economic decisions, make uh, other kinds of decisions. So I think that the current situation and what has been happening during the last two, three years, it contributes a lot into um, the, the, the goals mentioned or uh, the, the highlights of this uh, very strategy. So in 2019, when the document was presented at the Russia-Africa summit, we could feel that those would be the trends and the, and the directions where things will be moving to, but definitely we had no idea of exactly how the situations would be unfolding. Of course, uh, which is uh, very imperative. Sometimes uh, we cannot uh, uh, determine the, the future, but then uh, when the, 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 the changes or the situations come, we try to adapt and see how we can define a new perspective. And uh, of course, like you mentioned, it's about international cooperation. It's about uh, defining perspectives and of course, uh, ensuring a, a mutual benefit of uh, relations existing between uh, countries. And of course, today are focused is uh, the relationship between uh, especially economic relationship between uh, Africa and the, the Russian uh, Federation let me come to you Mr. Ellis uh, you were one of the authors of uh, this uh, uh, strategy vision 2040 uh, of uh, uh, Africa that actually accentuated on development seeing economic development and growth across all spheres in Africa so looking at the changes which have occurred like we underlined uh, in the preamble we, we saw a hike in uh, geopolitics geoeconomics and other uh, events that have characterized the global world in recent times from COVID-19 and uh, what have you so in your perspective wh what do you think uh, needs to be corrected uh, as far as the Africa strategy agenda uh, 2040 is concerned uh, to make sure it doesn't derail from its set or defined objective. Thank you, Clarice. Um, it was this vision um, that I must say uh, was put into motion by um, Ms. Julia Bird. Um, and where we had to decide how we would go about building Africa if we were to receive the keys to develop her. Because most of the information that we see about Africa, it's typically about how bad the situation is. The corruption, the poverty, the fact that um, you know there are no infrastructure, and the destitution. So in sitting down together, we wanted to take the opportunity to create the best vision that we could of the, this beautiful continent. We wanted to do justice to her as well by identifying, yes, there are problems, but if you look very closely on the other side, there are a lot of exciting possibilities and opportunities. And so let us try to create a vision that will see us capitalize on those opportunities. And so it was through that, in that spirit, that we came together to vision Africa. Of course, we could not have imagined that a few months down the line, we would have a global pandemic um, in COVID-19. And then, of course, we, we could not have imagined that there would be um, the, the, the special operation mission um, that Russia would take um, into the Donbass in order to actually liberate the people of Donbass. We could not have envisioned um, that um, Nord Stream 2 would have been destroyed and blamed on, on Russia. 
um, you know, we could not have imagined that um, the relations could result in such devastating economic war and blockade. We could not have imagined um, that we sit now here in this um, bifurcation point in history, not knowing whether we will be taking on a CBDC as a result of the collapse of the global uh, monetary system that we, we see currently happening. We could not have imagined whether we were going to go into a new paradigm, you know, not Bretton Woods 2.0, but something else that is far more egalitarian and far more mutually beneficial to the people of Africa that have been left in destitution, I must say. Um, it has been a dereliction of duty on the part of the international community to see um, Africa squalor like it has been in squalor over the last decades without trying to bring light to this. Um, it, is, it is an epidemic of, of poverty, you know, and, and, and the international community should have raised the alarm a lot sooner. And so here we are taking the opportunity. Not, it's not just the WEF and Klaus Schwab that have a vision for the world and for the continent of Africa. We Africans, we Russians, we um, Brazilians and so forth and so on, the other part of the world have a vision for ourselves. And so this is what we would like to share together to see whether we can build on this. Uh, which is very imperative, uh, Ms. Uh, Ellis. I, I will stay with you. Uh, in our opening statement, I said, uh, I quoted the words of uh, Dr. Laurence Ndong, uh, a, a Gabonese uh, politician, uh, and she said, more than anything, African people need their sovereignty be, to be respected. We equally know that sovereignty is one of the, the aspects that uh, uh, actually uh, uh, you and others underlined uh, under when it came to uh, writing down the uh, vision 2040 so with with all the, the the happenings around the world around africa you see uh, the quest to cover a sphere of influence so let's try to understand now how can africa amidst all of this uh, maintain its sovereignty or can we say there is a push for a new definition of sovereignty given the, the, the hike in the geopolitical game across the continent? Very, very important issue. It is very, very clear that if you don't have control over your own resources, over your own voice, over your own opinions, um, then you will never be able to express freedom. You see, the American Constitution today still represents the preeminent document that was ever conceived over the last few thousand years, over the last few thousands of years, which specifically defines in the spirit of what it is to be free, what it is for people to be free, what it is for a, a, a country that is made up of people to be free. Um, because this particular um, topology or framework never existed before. We had monarchies mm -hmm. and primarily, and we had emperors and kings and so forth and so on. So we always had a ruler by decree. Never before had we had the idea that a people were not subjects, but we were free citizens. And so what does that mean? It means that as an individual, I have inalienable rights, and my rights cannot be determined by an entity or be, be taken away from me, because they are endowed on each individual um, by God, by Almighty God. And so, because of this natural hierarchy, it means that any institution that would, in subterfuge or try to sabotage these rules, to try to become God, where we have to be subservient to them. And in other words, compromise or these inalienable rights. The American constitution calls those institutions illegal. And there are many institutions operating around the world today that occupy positions of power and they are operating outside of the spirit of the law. And so sovereignty a people that is able to express themselves and to 
you know, put into action their vision for themselves in an autonomous manner without coercion and influence from outside um, by another force. This is something that we need to re-educate all the peoples of the world so that in one voice we can start to understand that we do not serve a government, we do not serve an administration or a technocracy. We serve by our choice, Almighty God, and therefore we have these inalienable rights that is given to us that we should have the right to be free to express our, 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 our these rights in a collective fashion. And so sovereignty is the pillar on which all things is built because it is a metaphysical concept that links into spirituality and into philosophy. So without this direct link into these topics, we're unable to you know, refine it in the most beautiful sense. And the Americans have done this for us. So let us not try to redo the work of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and these great men, but let us build on it and saying that um, let us be sovereign at first so that we can take decisions um, to build ourselves with, you know, without intervention from outside that would want to torpedo our efforts. Of course, uh, cooperation without infringing and uh, sovereignty, the sovereignty of African people, the sovereignty of African uh, government. Uh, uh, coming back to you, uh, Yulia Burke, uh, we are actually analyzing the 2040 vision and seeing the trends in Africa. Uh, in your perspective, as far as international con uh, cooperation is concerned, what are uh, some of those uh, African trends which, according to you, uh, you feel like we need to actually uh, uh, analyze to see how they can meet the dictates of uh, the vision of 2040 with the aim of of course meeting uh, the, the set goal um well um if we're talking about the uh, the strategy itself and the content of uh, what was uh, put together back in uh, 2019 it talks about um, many aspects, the the most, uh, let's say, fundamental ones. So that is not only sovereignty, that is like the very foundation, but also finance and monetary policy, um, energy, um, specifically electricity and access to energy, education, culture, and governance. And while we were um, going through all of the materials and talking to experts, uh, we discovered that there is so much of um, heritage, so much of uh, governance models that uh, were being used in Africa or are still existent uh, parallel to the official institutions that are based on, you know, uh, wisdom and respect for the experience of previous generations, which is much more balanced in terms of relations with nature and being respectful to nature and its resources and many other things. So there is a lot to learn and there is a lot to rediscover in terms of that heritage. And here we can also um, uh, talk about the uh, culture that at some point uh, has gone from, you know, somewhere um, to the background, right? So uh, when we talk about um, education, when we talk about uh, culture in uh, uh, a lot of African countries, there is, uh, um, uh, there is something uh, lacking, which is, you know, a, a sense of um, uh, like more of a focus on uh, the local culture is definitely needed because what was being exposed for uh, many uh, decades, if not centuries, is a focus on the uh, achievements or products of the Western culture. While, you know, those are not exactly, well, this is not something that has grown um, in Africa, and it does not necessarily mean that those are the best practices, right? So when we were uh, doing some of the research on this, uh, what was discovered is that one of the key issues is to be able to uh, um, analyze, uh, rethink um, the uh, cultural heritage, right? And to put that uh, to put that to the focus of attention, to make sure that uh, education reflects uh, the the uh, cultural values and you know the value systems that were being transmitted from one generation to uh, the next one, right? 
And uh, there is a lot of wisdom contained in that. And in terms of education, another, I suppose, important aspect is that in in modern day, it's uh, it's very important to implement uh, the uh, the modern technologies and digital uh, technologies in order just to make uh, you know the um, everyday life easier. And when we talk about education, it's not just about schools and uh, uh, primarily education or university education, but it's also the access to knowledge that every person should have, and the access to um, to new skills, new professions, um, access to opportunities, basically uh, speaking, right? So continuous education, adult education are also important parts of the uh, uh, document and important points made there that people uh, uh, people should have uh, uh, the, the necessary, uh, let's say, preconditions and the necessary, uh, um, well, equipment and uh, the necessary uh, technical, let's say, and material conditions to be able to access uh, information, learn, acquire new skills and acquire professions that they think are of a better um, uh, suitability for them. Stay with you, uh, Yulia. Uh, we know that uh, the Vision 2040 is uh, was a well and remains a well articulated uh, document. Of course, when it comes to uh, giving a, a, a facelift or a positive look in uh, the uh, Africa's uh, economic trajectory, uh, and we know that uh, uh, the uh, Africa and uh, the Russian Federation actually bracing up for the uh, second uh, Africa-Russia summit. We saw other countries that uh, apparently like I mentioned there's a mad rush eh? for the continent Africa we saw uh, Tikat uh, coming we see uh, saw Turkey coming China and then there's the US Africa summit uh, there was a US Africa summit and now we are getting to to having a uh, the second Russia Africa summit Let's look at uh, uh, this well articulated document and, of course, look at uh, the much slated uh, international parliamentary uh, Russia uh, Africa uh, summit that is in prelude to, to, to the grand event in uh, July. So, according to you, what, what are the peculiarities uh, of, of this uh, parliamentary summit and, of course, how will it help to, to guide uh, the, the two parties together towards defining a strong uh, economic? Uh, um, well, that's uh, definitely the key to um, mutually beneficial cooperation and development to have options and different partners to choose from. That's exactly the, uh, um, you know, the, the necessary condition for uh, development when you can uh, choose uh, Chinese technologies or Indian, Brazilian, Russian, whatsoever, and pick the most suitable option without uh, looking back at someone whose business interests might be affected by that or political interest, right? So I think that uh, um, the current uh, the current clash uh, between uh, Russia and the uh, West is creating opportunities for Africa as, uh, you know, and BRICS itself, and the fact that this year's BRICS summit will will be held in South Africa, uh, that gives a completely different uh, negotiating uh, position for many of the uh, African actors, right? When they uh, can choose if they want uh, their nuclear plants to be built by French companies or Russian companies, and they can compare the prices, the effectiveness, the technologies, and make their own decisions. So um, in terms of business, I think that uh, the... Uh, the events taking place at the global arena are opening up new um, opportunities as well. But in some cases, the pressure uh, being created um, by the Western countries sometimes just uh, implies that when uh, African uh, countries want to buy, let's say, fertilizers from Russia, they have to they have to uh, pay for the middleman coming from countries as uh, Turkey and Dubai, and that makes the the price higher. Uh, for the very same product, because uh, some of the uh, direct uh, trade relations, some of uh, direct trade relations are troubled. Yet, uh, it only shows that the demand for some of the uh, products produced in Russia, some of the uh, technologies is still high because not even sanctions could stop this trade, right? So if a lot of, uh, a lot of different ways are found and, you know, a higher price is paid for those very... Uh, products or technologies, it means that those are in high demand. 
and that is key. So uh, in 2019, there were quite a lot of uh, memorandums of understanding or memorandums of uh, cooperation signed. And of course, the pandemic had some negative effects in terms of implementation of those deals. Yet, I suppose that uh, even in, in quite complicated uh, current uh, situations when not even direct payments are possible, we would still see an increase in trade and cooperation and even more agreements and, and contracts and deals signed at the uh, upcoming Russia-Africa summit because there is now a clear understanding of uh, you know, the real uh, illusion-free uh, basis for the cooperation that is, uh, that is in place, right? So uh, I think that the parliamentary forum as well would help to... Um, to build better ties and there there is more and more of uh, meetings taking place more and more interest at the level of businesses so i'm absolutely sure that the uh, upcoming summit would also show that there is a lot of uh, a lot of mutual interest in terms of african countries and and russia and both sides have to have something to bring to the table and something to offer so uh Yes, I think uh, such events as well, they, they help to build direct relations, to discuss things and to see the general uh, perspective. And uh, we will see um, at the uh, parliamentary summit in March, there will be a special part of it uh, dedicated to um, uh, uh, Russia, Africa and relations with African countries. So that should be uh, quite interesting, not to mention the uh, Russia-Africa summit that uh, it's already clear that uh, there will be a lot of uh, business deals uh, signed and discussed, and there will be a lot of uh, new cooperation areas uh, opening up. Achieve uh, uh, opening uh, uh, new uh, areas of cooperation, a uh, win-win uh, cooperation. Uh, Mr. Elijah Enwakojo is uh, joined in now, uh, researcher with Leeds University on African Development. You are most welcome to the program, sir. And today we we are talking, uh, uh, looking at the African trends which have been affected by uh, the global changes, and of course, seeing how Africa can fit in. And we are looking also at the Africa. Uh, vision 2040 strategy that was outlined uh, in 2019 uh, uh, following a summit that was held in uh, Berlin, Germany, uh, the Foresight Summit, talking African growth and uh, development. So in your own perspective uh, and as a, a development uh, uh, expert, uh, so what do you think are, are those trends which have occurred or uh, continue to occur in Africa and are of course impediment to the total or the fast uh, development uh, uh, of the continent? Yeah. Um... Sorry, we're coming in a little bit late. Um, I have a, something just came up. I have to attend to uh, a meeting. But um, in relation to what you just mentioned there, I think Africa need to come together and have a coordinated action. They need a coordinated action on what the action plan is, the continent of Africa. The number one thing uh, issue that's dragging Africa behind that you will understand, uh, Clarice, and the rest of uh, are your viewers. It's wrong priority. If you look on the continent of Africa, if you look at the budgets that are being drawn by the African companies, I mean, uh, uh, countries, whether you're talking about Central African region, you talk about South African region, you talk about the North African region, you talk about the East African region, all of the world, well, let's say with the exception of South African region, most of that you have fifty percent of the budget in those countries earmarked for security and war. Those are not sustainable budget initiatives. There is no way that fifty percent of your national budget is going to be spent on war or security or whatnot. And then you expect you expect that the rest of the 50% is going to go into all the sectors of the economy. That's number one. Africa need to tackle the issue of guns blazing on the continent. There is not going to be development in the face of war. 
whether you're talking about Bali, you're talking about Burkina Faso, you're talking about Cameroon, you're talking about any other country on the on the continent of Africa. Guns are still blazing. So that is number one. Number two, the priorities. What is African priority? Because if you do not have your priority, somebody will set the priority for you. <clears throat> Yulia there just talked about the African-Russian cooperation. When the African president goes to Russia and they are discussing with Russia, what are their priorities? When they go to Washington, D.C. and they're having a summit with Joe Biden, what are their priorities? When they are within the regional blocks, what are their priorities? As long as you do not have your priorities, somebody else was We talked about the climate issue that is plaguing the world, and Africa is paying the brunt of the climate crisis that is happening all over the world because one percent increase in climate change is going to be globally felt, whether it was caused in China or in the United States or in Europe or in China or any other part of the world. The rest of the world are going to suffer from it. And Africa is not spared. So Africa needs to come out with this strategy and say, okay, these Western countries are the ones doing the polluting and all whatnot. They have to pay in, and Africa needs to get in and get the resources necessary to do the mitigation. Because the impact of it we saw in Nigeria very, not long ago, that but there was a lot of you know uh, damage that was done because of the flooding and all whatnot. Those are the impact of climate change, but it's not caused by Africans, it's caused by somewhere else. So Africa needs to... Oh, yes, Africa needs to talk about security, where there's war or there's no war. But what strategy do you want to talk about security? Do you want to talk about guns for guns? Or you want to talk about dialogue? I have said on many occasions, many occasions, Clarice, that the problems in Africa will be solved round it, on a round table. They will not be solved with the bullet of the gun. It's not going to be done that way. Even when you have called each other terrorists, this one, you've called names or whatnot, at the end of the day, you're going to sit round the table and negotiate and discuss peace. So Africa needs to strategize and have their perspective before a second party comes in to say, okay, can I help you in A, B, C? But if you don't have your goals and your strategies in place, the person party, the second party will set the agenda for you and the agenda, they have their own interest. Every country in the world have their own interest. So without that, Africa will still be in the doldrum and whatever we talk about 2020, 2040s, tiger discussion. So Africa need to set the strategy and priorities right. Mr. Enwaku, Africa needs to set its priorities right. Uh, let's let's look at, you have highlighted some of the problems uh, that the continent Africa is facing. And today we are looking at these trends across Africa and of course looking at international cooperation. Uh, there, there was somebody who highlighted uh, like to, to, to be able to meet the development that you want, there is need for cooperation, constructive international cooperation, exchange of expertise. But then now, let's look at, from the African perspective, what is that thing, uh, I want us to dwell on the nature of politics across the continent, especially in present day society, and see how wrong politics, uh, which I'll put in quotes, is actually helping to, to impede the growth or the steady development of African economies. Look, talking about politicians putting their political interest first before the interest or the collective interest of the African people. And of course, uh, and how is this actually affecting uh, the, 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 co the continent's relationship at the international arena? Okay, I guess you're still referring to me, correct? Okay, so 
I want to give you a case study here. It's, it's a case study that's making the rounds in the international development arena. We had international experts that came to Uganda and they did an evaluation of uh, the gold de deposit in Uganda. And when they did the evaluation of gold deposit in Uganda, they went through some of the Britain Woods institutions. I'm giving you current issues that just happened. It was discovered that in Uganda, the gold deposit in that country is worth 13 trillion, sorry, 13 billion. Thirteen billion dollars. No, it is. It is. It is trillion. Million. It is trillion. Can you hear me? Yes, it is trillion. I think it is trillion, not billion. Trillion. I think it is trillion. I think you are right the first time. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that correction. There. So, when they came out with that ad arrangement and everything, we realized. That was a speech that was made by the president. You had people who went into that negotiation. At the end of the day, the government was given, I think, 1.2 billion, if I remember what the president of the country came up with. Out of 30 trillion deposits, the government was allowed or given, proposed by the companies that had that, uh, uh, that negotiation, that the government would get something less than 2 billion. Imagine that. Imagine that. Just think for a second what that means. What that means is less than 1% of the deposit of the resources of that country is going to be used or is going to be apportioned as royalty for that country. Who is doing that next session? They're Africans. They are their own people. How does it come? How does it happen that the Britain Woods institution that was involved, foreign bodies that are involved, think that that is fair? That a country will have a deposit of 13 trillion, but the royalties that they will get from the, or their own share that they will get from will be less than 2%. That tells you that Africans, for some reason, do not have the interest of Africans at heart. Before you go to cooperation with somebody, before you cooperate with another person, you have to have the interest of your own nation at heart. You have to go to that negotiation with good faith. But if you have people like this, I'm telling you that we'll be talking about this discussion for a very long time. Many countries want to cooperate with Africa. There's no doubt about that. We have to cooperate. Africa cannot be an isolated entity. It can be an island. We're going to work with them. But on what terms? Who calls the shots? Is it the Britain Woods institutions that are going to call the shots? The Africans that are going to call the shots? Or somebody else that's going to call the shots? So it's not an issue of cooperation, but how do we go to the table? Do we understand our worth? That's sovereignty. where the problem is, Clarice. Okay. Okay. Sovereignty. Of course. The answer Mr. is sovereignty. Mr. Ellis, you want brother. to say something regarding that? Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, who's okay. calling the shots and who's not calling the shots? Um, um, over the last, I mean, since Bretton Woods, 1944, um, the, the, the creation of standing drawing rights, giving um, the pound, giving the dollar preeminence for international trade. Um, so making it mandatory for each country to be only be able to operate in dollar these things, my brother, is what has kept Africa down. Being forced to use a currency that is controlled by another state. And also, our own central banks in, in Africa are not controlled by our own people. So we are not sovereign. So these we in going back to the drawing board, which is what um, the, the, the Africa 24, the strategy document is all about. It's highlighting the fact that how business has been conducted over the last uh, 70, 80 years is, is not in a manner that is in Africa's interest. And so we have to envision a new reality, a new approach. And the first thing highlighted in the document as preeminent is sovereignty. The second thing is about development. Now, 
development, you have to be able to create an, econo an economy that is able to produce and produce in a manner that is profitable. How to do this means you need infrastructure. The most important infrastructure you need is electrical energy. It's energy. And if you look at the situation in sub-Saharan Africa, it's absolutely a crisis. It's an energy crisis. <laughs> and nobody has been talking about this energy crisis. <laughs> go to the UN, you know, go to all the other international institutions. Nobody is doing any root cause analysis as to why are we in the position that we are in so that we can I mean, ex exorcise the demon that is preventing Africa from developing. And that is because it, she doesn't have sovereignty. And so electricity, the energy um, is, is very, very important. That must be documented as, as critical when building on an, an infrastructural uh, strategy. So we, there are many things in terms of the relationship between Africa um, and Russia that could be mutually beneficial because if the assumption is that during negotiations, Africa on one side of the negotiating table must remain sovereign and also Russia on its side of the negotiation table also has to be sovereign. The question becomes, where are our interests and where do they intersect? And that understanding is what creates the possibility to create uh, a relationship in terms of how it manifests itself economically as win-win. The West historically has not negotiated in the spirit of win-win. <laughs> they have negotiated in the spirit of zero-sum game. Zero-sum game, winning for them. And this comes out of their own, um, I would say, their state their state strategy, because it comes from um, the Wolfowitz Doctrine, which says that the America must remain preeminent and must essentially attack any country that would want to essentially express their sovereignty in Eurasia, Russia, hint, hint. So we're going to have a new reality, and that is the multipolar world that we see is emerging in the wake of um, COVID-19. And the question is, how do we now engage on a multipolar environment with the understanding that the old is now dying, is now dead, and now we have a new reality? Let us forge this reality. This is the conversation that I hope that we can share together right here, because at the end of the day, Africa has many problems. And most of the time, that's what we talk about. But let us try to use the energy, in, 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 in the same energy, in, in, in critiquing the, the problems, in making it constructive. How do we then help ourselves to develop? By putting forth sound ideas, sound roadmaps, sound strategies and policies for Africa development. And Russia-Africa relations are extremely important in, in, in terms of strategic relationship. Um, for, for, for fulfilling a sovereign Africa and a prosperous Africa. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Ellis. Uh, thank you. We're going to continue uh, to uh, analyze our topic uh, this day uh, uh, with you, uh, 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 Yulia Burke. Uh, we know th that uh, 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 Russian President Vladimir Putin is one of those leaders who outrightly uh, uh, underscored uh, the place of uh, the uh, African continent uh, free trade area and today when we look at uh, like you all have mentioned already when we talk cooperation we look at how we can benefit from it without actually uh, violating the autonomy of countries so in your own perspective uh, uh, how can uh, the pending uh, uh, Russia Africa summit uh, uh, fast track uh, uh, this uh, great uh, economic uh, uh, ties between the Russian Federation and Africa and of course 
course, respecting uh, the autonomy of each country, like uh, Mr. Ellis uh, just uh, uh, mentioned. And of course, what are those areas uh, that can herald uh, a sustainable socioeconomic development, both in Africa, especially in Africa, and of course, in Russia as well? Well, um, when you look at uh, the relations that Russia currently has with uh, different um, African countries, you would see that there has been quite a lot of uh, cooperation in terms of uh, military-related uh, issues and uh, weapon trade that for, for several countries that would probably be um, at the very top. But then you have uh, some close ties in terms of... Uh, uh, trade and the uh, the grain coming from Russia, from Russia has been uh, and fertilizers uh, coming from Russia has been quite in demand, right? Uh, then um, you have some of the um, educational exchanges. You have some background of uh, cooperation in terms of uh, energy sector and building uh, of some of the facilities, hydroelectric stations and uh, um, nuclear projects. Some of which. Some, some of uh, the new ones are, are being um, a bit, uh, let's say, frozen at the moment, yet uh, the, um, the ideas are there and the uh, implementation has uh, already started in some of the cases. Yet at the same time, there is uh, quite, a lot of, uh, um, quite a lot of areas of cooperation that are less explored, right? And that has a lot to do with uh, agriculture, for instance, right? Because uh, Despite of the fact that uh, Africa has uh, perfect conditions for harvesting several times a year, the, the potential is not um, is not uh, really used to the full extent. And I mean, when you just think about it, that Africa is buying grain from Russia, and then you look at the map and you discover where Russia is located at and uh, Africa and the climate differences, you start uh, asking questions, why is it the case that uh, uh, that African countries are buying grain from Russia and not the other way around, right? Uh, so there is a lot to explore in terms of uh, agriculture, cooperation, and that can be mutually beneficial because some of the approaches and technologies which uh, have been elaborated in Russian hardcore uh, circumstances could be of use for um, African states. At the same time, uh, supply from Africa to Russia uh, can reach uh, greater numbers, right? And um, there is definitely a lot of potential in that, uh, a lot of potential in um, mutual, uh, mutually beneficial research and new materials. So um, there are a lot of um, such projects being already implemented, and uh, uh, there is a lot uh, of work that the uh, scientists are doing in order to uh, uh, promote uh, such cooperation. Of course, energy is one of the uh, areas where cooperation could be very beneficial because the current Russian nuclear technologies are on the one hand uh, safe. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is this new, for instance, nuclear plant uh, uh, just launched last year in Russia that reuses the nuclear waste for production of new energy. So this is uh, um, this is a, a definitely breakthrough uh, technology because the problem of nuclear waste that played a huge role in uh, in um, uh, the refuse of uh, South African actors to build one in, in their country. Now, this problem is eliminated as the nuclear waste gets reused to produce um, energy. So uh, that is also interesting. But aside from that, there are quite a lot of interesting digital solutions being offered by uh, Russia. And, you know, some of the digital services that are um, used here on a daily basis can be implemented. So I uh, should also mention that, for instance, after September last year, when uh, uh, when um, in Russia, in domestic pol politics of Russia, uh, some changes were made and the partial uh, mobilization was uh, launched, right? Um, uh, some of the IT specialists from Russia uh, have flown to other countries, including South Africa. And I know that uh, at the moment, there is quite a lot of cooperation um, and collaboration projects uh, being discussed because there are some of the uh, solutions that could be easily adapted and uh, and used uh, for the benefit of South African entrepreneurs, right? Um, and they can, in, in such a way, they can avoid making some of the mistakes that were already made by others, right? 
So uh, there is there is a community, an IT community, I would say, working in it, not just in Africa, but in other countries where they, they have uh, relocated in some cases. And we see that even this crisis, even such events as, you know, partial mobilization here and the uh, military conflict, the special military military operation, it also does open some, some uh, opportunities and also uh, it crystallizes the uh, essence of some of the, uh, uh, you know, relations and highlights uh, the uh, uh, perspective of perspectives uh, of those. So I think there is uh, really a lot uh, that uh, can be possible and a lot of uh, exchange um, that can be done in terms of, uh, you know, trade and education and um, culture and infrastructure uh, projects and many other things. So we could see that even after the previous summit and even after this um, cultural event for youth, uh, I think of 2018 or 17, the, the youth uh, festival, there was a growing interest from the um, African actors to Russia. And I mean, we see more people being interested in um, you know, developing tourism or developing some other, uh, let's say, small business to small business cooperation, some some of the, uh, um, uh, you know, medium business to medium, medium business cooperation. And I can say even more of that in terms of uh, um, uh, healthcare, in terms of healthcare and in terms of uh, exchanges of some of the uh, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say pharmaceutical um, uh, industry because it's more about like herbal uh, medicine and some of those, uh, you know, using the, the herbal uh, plants and this kind of things. This is uh, this is uh, very much of interest for both because there is quite a lot of, uh, you know, plants, uh, quite a lot of um, healing uh, medicines that are well known in Africa and not known um, at all in, in Russia. So I know of several cooperation projects of the kind that are at the moment being implemented between African countries and Russia. So you can continue the list uh, uh, for quite a long time. And there is a lot uh, opening up even due to the current crisis. Just to remind our viewers joining us about this is Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television Afric Media. We are analyzing uh, uh, the uh, Africa Vision 2040 uh, strategy and of course looking at how the situations or the global uh, changes in the world have uh, affected some uh, of this uh, agenda and how can it be readjusted to meet the changing times. Uh, uh, I will continue with you Mr. Enwako. I uh, quite remember some time ago uh, the head of the African Union Commission Musa Fakim Ahmad underlined uh, that uh, of course Africa is conversant of uh, the uh, uh, multilateralism on the continent and of course aware of all uh, the, the the interest the game of interest across the continent and of course he also underlined that it is time for Africa to strategize on how she can uh, redefine and of course to, to bargain well, especially when it comes to international or uh, cooperation or a relation. So in your own perspective, what do you think are those strategies that Africa can actually uh, uh, use to, to, to uh, or maybe the available diverse uh, opportunities that the continent can use to spur development? across the continent. Uh, thank you, Clarice. Can you hear me very well? Can you hear me? Sorry? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. You can go on, Mr. Inoku. Um, I just want to, first of all, just mention a few things that William mentioned there. Um, this is not a hit on Russia, but this is just, as we're discussing, so that some people from that part of the world understand where Africans stand when it comes to relationship with all the nations all over the world. When you look at the international community, the African diaspora, for example, they have an, an uneasiness um, dealing with Russia right now. They will love, because I'm talking to them, I'm doing some research, and talking to a lot of researchers and people in the diaspora, there is so much visibility of Russia in the area of security matters. In fact, there's one report that came out 
more than 90% of the contract, 80% of the contract, they are signed so far as security contracts. So she has just listed a host of other issues that China, I mean, and Russia seems to be doing that. But it would appear there's not much visibility on those issues. So those international partners can be more visible in the area of education, <clears throat> in the area of food security. Because you understand that Africa has 30% of arable land. We are talking about land that you don't need manure, you don't need fertilizers, you don't need anything in order to grow the crops. 30% of the arable land in the world in Africa, by like just till the soil and plant your goods. But Africans do not engage themselves in extensive agriculture. They do um, local agriculture, extensive agriculture that you can produce in mass quantity and export on the means of preserving your, your products, the means of transforming those products into finished, finished products before you send it out to the world so that you have the benefit of transformation within the soil of Africa are currently non-existent. So in terms of multilateralism, African countries should go into those areas where you are going to, number one, there's a lot of technology out there. You mentioned Mr. Mataima, and sometimes they do a lot of speeches. This is not a criticism of the, of the leadership or whatever he's doing. We can talk about that some of the day. But just on the issue of principle and perspective on an agenda, they need to set the agenda right. Because number one, if you look at the technology that is in the West and the amount of technology transfer in Africa is close to 1% when it comes to technology transfer. When you are talking about the major technological hub in the world, do not currently have centers or branches in Africa. That is one area that Africa is focused on. Because the world is no more going to the analog system. The world is moving forward in technology. They need to be transfer of technology from the West or from the East, whether you have from Russia or China. They need to be that transfer of technology to the African soil. Mr. Mahima, if you're listening, you pay attention to this. Number two, if you're talking about more tutorialism in the 2024 agenda, Africa itself needs to clean its own house. It is very difficult for somebody to move from Cameroon to Nigeria or from Nigeria to Ivory Coast to the West. There are so many roadblocks in terms of business strategy. The African free trade zone needs to come to an effect. So that Africa, you can talk about motorism <clears throat> with the Western world when in your own house, your own backyard, you cannot trade with your own neighbors. You yeah. have a lot of roadblocks to move. You know, somebody came from Nigeria on this show and was talking about how difficult it was for him to get a visa to move from Nigeria to Senegal. But it was easy for him to get a visa to move to Europe. Why do the Europeans make it easy? Because they know that that is a business strategy to <coughs> a flow of commerce from their, country, from, from their continent to Africa and back and forth. So they make it easy for businessmen to do that. But if we make it so difficult, even within our own continent, for our own business and that business across our borders, then you can talk about mortalizing across our own, I mean, across African continent when you have not done it within African continent. Number four, we talk about education. In Africa, <clears throat> the kind of education we get in, a country like, I'll take an example of uh, Rwanda and Cameroon. But the literacy rate is somewhere around 87 to 90 percent. But what kind of education are we having? Africa should look at the strategy when it comes to education. Instead of building certificates where people will get degree in this and this and that, at the end of the day, they're not able to get a job, go into technological and social education. I don't have to be listing all the rights here, but Africa should go to revamp its educational system in such a way that. Those who come out from that product, those who are the product of that education, should be, you know, <clears throat> useful to the economy and not start running to the West like some of us here to engage in this and that. They should be useful within that economy. Number three, you talked about mortality. African culture should be a marketing tool for the rest of the world. It's so simple. And the rest of the world wants to know much about that. 
Africa seems to be a black box right now. No, because people don't want to know about Africa. Because we ourselves, we have not sold what we have. We are not proud of what we have. We've not sold ourselves. We've sold ourselves cheap or ever hidden. And not only that, we are talking about this pan African media right now. We're talking about African issues. You will realize that the image of Africa out of Africa is that of a negative image, it's out of poverty, out of sickness, out of war, out of killing, in such a way that the investment world does not have hope in Africa. Because if I'm an investor <clears throat> and I want to invest in a country and all the information that comes from that country, war, poverty, negativity, and there's nothing positive. Of course, they do their research and they come out with this data that shows that investing in this country is a high risk. So Africa should make the investment environment attractive to foreign bodies. So I can go on and on and on and on in terms of strategy. But again, we should put our house in order. It is true that, you know, my colleague from UK talked about sovereignty in Africa. And I agree with him on that end. But the number one issue that we are facing in Africa is not imperialism. Africans can solve their problem if they put personal interest aside for the good of the nations in Africa. Because I gave that example of you know, um, Uganda. It was Uganda that sat on the table and made that negotiation and went to those horrendous contracts with those institutions. It's not there, did not come to Uganda, but Uganda went to them and they negotiated that. The same thing happened in Tanzania until when Mugukuli came over and said, what kind of contract is this? He renegotiated almost 70% of the contracts on the terms of this, and within the four terms that he was president, we saw the drastic change that happened in Tanzania. He could take the case of Rwanda. It's the same thing. Yes, we do understand the impact of imperialism and, uh, and Western homogeny in Africa, but Africans need to put their own house in order. It what about the money, my brother? If we put our house in order, for example, my, my brother, nobody is going to come between you and your wife until you yes. let him or her come in. Nobody no, but in. um, it's it's actually not a it's not a it's not the best analogy, my brother, because uh, Clarice, can I just jump in here because it's very very important that we we talk about sovereignty a little bit more and about Africa solving its own problem. Can you? Clarice, can you just bring it in so that we have this discussion? Um, uh, okay. uh, are you yes, muted, Clarice? Because I cannot yeah. hear you. Yeah, Mister, I... you can go on, Mister. Yeah, no, I can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> no, no, this is quite important. Yeah. Because let's just let's just um, let's take let's step back a little bit and let's look, analyze the situation, right? Yeah. Um, if the assumption is that we are able to solve our own problems using our own efforts internally through internal dialogue. I think history and analysis of how the world works today in terms of how Western powers have exercised um, their strategic interest would not essentially agree with, with my brother here because there, there are, there's a thing called the military industrial complex. The military industrial complex is what we saw went into um, Iraq when Saddam Hussein wanted to rid himself of the American dollar. It is the same military industrial complex that went into Libya when our brother Gaddafi wanted to <laughs> just discuss the gold-backed dinar. And uh, the French in particular, Sarkozy, didn't like that. Do you know why? Because the CFA franc, my brother, the CFA franc, they never wanted real sovereignty for Africa, and real sovereignty can only happen if you control your money. And an inability to control your money is the prime, I believe, the prime thing that you can look at to definitively state that you are not sovereign and you're, you're incapable of essentially exercising sovereignty because it will be torpedoed by the military industrial complex. Okay, let me come in here. Just give me one second. Since we're having this discussion, Clarice, can you bring me in here? Please? <laughs> sure, let's have, let, let's, let's, let's have a conversation. <laughs> Clarice, can you bring me in here? Can she hear me? Are you muted, Clarice? I think you're muted. 
because they are. I don't know if she can hear me. I think she's muted. Yes, she, she's saying that you should continue. Continue. Okay. Because they are, my brother, they are concrete cases, case studies that we can do on that, on hypothesis. Right? Let's go case by case. You talked about the monetary issue in Africa, of course, without monetary uh, economic independence, we cannot even talk about illiteracy. African countries are suffering from that. But let's look at the French year, France year, for example. When the African countries of the ECOWAS system came together and came out with the ECO, right? They came out together, the ECO was adopted, and they're about to adopt the ECO as the money for the economic community of West African state. Who killed the plan? Ivory Coast. It is not who killed the plan. The plan is Ivory Coast that came in, killed that plan. We would have been talking about ECO today. That is money for the economic community of West African state. But that plan was killed because Watera allowed himself to be manipulated by the French. <laughs> if you do not allow somebody into your family, between you and your wife, that person will not have my a brother. Problem. Let me give you another example. Just, just give okay, me a okay, 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 go ahead. French Mogopoli, the prejudice, uh, predecessor of Mogopoli, when he was there, we saw the disaster that was happening in that country. When Mogopoli came in, my brother, that's an African. When he came in, he renegotiated 80% of all the contracts that were negotiated by his predecessor. And what happened? Within a space of four years, we saw what happened in Tanzania. That is not a Western puppet that came in and did that. It was an African leader that came in and made the changes. We look at Rwanda. As we speak today, the inflationary issue in Africa, for example, is somewhere, it's hovering somewhere between 4 to 6%. But in Rwanda, it is 2% inflation. All of the world is stopping from inflation. But Rwanda is leading the world in how to control this issue. How are they doing it? We have a leader that is independent of Western imperialism, is able to control their own currency, I mean, their own country. And so I can give a list of examples to tell you that there are cases all over the continent of Africa that have shown us that we can solve our own problem. Yes? Why did Watara hey, kill the ECOWAS? Please, uh, that is something that we are going to come to some other time, of course. Uh, okay, uh, let's okay, not okay, actually but... divert uh, from right. uh, uh, focus this day. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot, of course, to talk about. Uh, and of course, the goal <laughs> is to bring in solutions, practical solutions. Uh, we continue. I was with you, Mr. Uh, Enoko. I, I just want to continue now uh, with uh, uh, Yulia. Uh, taking from what you underlined, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Enoko, you said, uh, Africans can solve their problems. Yeah, it's true. But then what are those aspects? What are those things uh, that are actually impeding them from solving this problem? We talk about those things every day. We are conversant of the problems that the continent Africa is facing. And I think uh, when I look at the, the 2040 strategy uh, that was outlined and presented, of course, uh, bringing Africa to the fore. You made mention when they talk about Africa outside, they say so many negative things. But then uh, reading uh, uh, the uh, uh, 2040 uh, agenda, you, you see the, uh, the uh, problems of Africa uh, outlined and of course possible solutions. And with the changing times in your perspective, Yulia, what do you think? We, because as the world is evolving, we need to evolve and bring a new trend into the changes that are happening. So in your uh, capacity as a political scientist, given that we cannot dissociate what is happening, politics from what is happening in uh, the global world. So in your capacity, what can be done practically uh, to bring results to some of these uh, problems which are impeding economic growth across uh, Africa in particular? Well, um, the issue is um, quite complex and quite complicated, so we need to have um, quite a holistic approach to even try to dissect uh, this issue uh, and define the actual problems that were holding the Africans themselves back from solving the problems, right? Well, um, number one is that uh, Africa, just like many other countries in the world, have found themselves implemented into uh, a special kind of uh, 
um, institutional design created by quite a limited group of actors, right? And when I talk about it, I mean that the international or global institutions of today um, were created and are being governed by the rules that were designed without any kind of active participation from um, African uh, states or Latin American or Asian or Eastern European and so on, right? So we all live in this uh, institutional design that was created for us and we didn't have a say uh, when, or we didn't have much of a say when this was done. When some of the Africans were trying to implement their own solutions for the problems that they were observing, and unfortunately, we do have quite a lot of examples of that, not only what Clifton has just mentioned, but we can talk about many actors like Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara and a lot of other people who were trying to at least talk about things. And then, uh, you know, they were either killed or something else happened. And we observe the same kind of things happening now. So people who try to speak up, people who try to offer Pan-African uh, path right for uh you know more of cooperation and so on people who start uh, talking about some alternative solutions and natalie yamb as well the one who uh, just appeared on the screen here she's definitely one of those offering um, african solutions to african problems but th this kind of people are oftentimes being silenced they do not make it to mainstream media etc et right but this is not the only set of problems so institutional design is one um, economic system that, again, we didn't choose to live in, but we do at the moment, um, you know, using the uh, petrodollar system or using the CFA prank, which is even worse because the rates are, well, you know, all of it. So no need to go deep into the issue. Number three is um, a tremendous uh, cultural, a tremendous cultural uh, pressure and, you know, pressure in terms of the uh, soft power. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, we did have a conversation about it at some point, but many of the non-Westerners do have sort of a uh, inbuilt uh, inferior, inferiority complex, right? And this, also, this is also something um, holding uh, many people back around the globe in terms of uh, you know, promoting their own solutions for their own problem, or even standing up to say uh, what they think is true, right? And then um, another reason is that many of the um, institutions uh, and some of the uh, foundations that are actively working um, globally, not only in African countries, but also in African countries, the last thing they are interested in is actually solving the problems. Because once they solve the problem of poverty, once they solve the problem of healthcare, once they solve the problem related to some of the uh, local military conflicts, they will not be getting their budgets for next year. So what they are mostly interested in is uh, just making sure that something is done and there is enough to report on, and then saying that the problem has gone uh, you know, deeper and wider and everything, and they need to uh, expand their activities. And the corruption that grows on top of this, uh, given the fact that the audit is made by not alternative, but other, let's say, friendly structures, the corruption that has grown on top of it is tremendous as well. So a lot of the resources, instead of going and being used to solve the issues, uh, they uh, just get wasted on something else. Because when we talk about those problems with access to clean water uh, and, you know, poverty and hunger, solutions are out there. But um, implementation of those solutions and the will to implement those is uh, something different. So it's quite a complex issue and there is uh, a lot to it. But, um, you know, it, it, it would have to start uh, being resolved from something. Uh, we are going to continue with you, Mr. Elisa. We have just a few minutes to be together. Uh, let's, uh, I would love you to answer this question. We know that uh, geopolitics and uh, geoeconomics have uh, heightened uh, in recent uh, times. And uh, this uh, apparently uh, 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 seems to have affected the economic pattern of African uh, uh, countries. Uh, and uh, that uh, we want to look at the place of, of, of the, uh, uh, the, the 
pending uh, Africa, Russia Africa summit. And of course, uh, since uh, it was your focus uh, when drafting uh, the uh, uh, Vision 20 uh, for the uh, strategy. So, what is the, the, the place of uh, the Russia Africa summit in helping? Uh, African countries uh, to uh, maybe uh, bring solutions to the problems faced by the continent since we have seen that it's somehow difficult to for Africa to actually bring its own uh, solution to its own problem with the uh, presence of globalization because apparently the other parties opinion now counts so what can we say regarding <laughs> this uh, yeah, of course, I look forward to um, attending uh, the Russia-Africa Summit that is coming up in July. It would be a pleasure to participate and to discuss all of these issues to see how it is that we could go about implementing a holistic and win-win strategy for all parties involved. Now, the, the market should be capitalist, and capitalist market, you know, the, the consumer um, has the right to experience market forces, supply demand. And if there is supply demand pressures, then price will be determined. The thing about it is Africa never really had many options in terms of where it could shop for its, um, let's say, international relations, which then we could build into economic relations. Africa was always impeded and therefore as a consequence of this, we had limited platforms. So of course, we had the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and of course, that is connected back into the the, the United Nations architecture. Um, and of course, um, uh, Madame Yulia has mentioned um, that all of those things happened um, in in the in the in in the in the days of the end of of, of um, or months of, of World War II, and of course, sat at the table where the European powers. Uh, the, the United States, um, um, and of course, you know, they were the ones who were creating the, the architecture for all of how the world functions today. No African stakeholders sat at the table. Um, no, no South African stakeholders, sorry, South Americans sat at the table. And many um, Asian countries are not represented, if any. So, well, China is, but um, I'm talking about the rest, like India, they are significantly important. Um, an emerging economy. Therefore, we need to re revisit the architecture. This is a part of what we documented in, in Africa 2040 strategy because it became extremely, um, you know, when we did a root cause analysis on what the, where, where the problems were for us to actually create what we wanted, we saw these things as risks and they were real risks, not imaginary. And we were able to then say, okay, fine, let's make sovereignty sacrosanct, so we can negotiate in good faith, and we can give, we can, we can take, but we won't be exploited. And um, you know, we need to think about, you know, how it is that each country in Africa can maximize its output potential. These are the things that we recommended. That every single country um, has a specific, unique thing to offer. No country um, we, we may compete. In, in whether we, 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 it's with respect to cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana, but we have something unique. You will, we will drive up productivity through competition, and then we will, we will, but we will renegotiate the architecture in terms of we won't sell just the raw cocoa any longer, because we want added value. So we will invest in the infrastructure so we could then participate in the manufacturing and the refining of these um, produce. These are the things that we've never had before. So you can imagine Africa taking, you know, the decision that we would now want to have an incubator, you know, in the sense of refinement of cocoa. We can take something from Switzerland, but they don't want to give it to us. We could take something from Belgium. They don't want to give it to us. So guess what? We're going to go to Russia. Why not? So, you know, we need to, you know, do essentially um, feasibility analysis on every single country in Africa to see how it is that they're going to create the most optimized um, infrastructural develop, development program and then create a roadmap and then we can start to break it down into seeing what the chronology should be, etc. Okay, thank you. And we can do this in, 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 in the Russia-Africa summit. <laughs> so, yeah.
very important uh, mr elisa uh, talking about uh, how we we can optimize uh, uh, the opportunities that are on uh, to our own advantage uh, i will end uh, today's uh, edition with you mr uh, elijah enwaku uh, getting your uh, general perspective on uh, the the trends in africa international cooperation and of course the role of uh, african leaders in helping to see the continent attend the level uh, that it has to maybe uh, aware especially in terms of uh, economic uh, transformation to see a clear economic trajectory for the continent africa i will begin by saying that africans need to understand what their priorities are i said this before and i say it again because all we have discussed here with my colleague with Yulia, with my colleague with UK, all good and fine. We can have Africa on the negotiating table to restructure the international community, the international order. We have an African on the World Bank who is going to make sure that we are not taking loans 10% meanwhile, the rest of the country are taking 0.5%. We can do all that. But at the end of the day, if what happened in Uganda is going to continue happening, we will be on the same spot. I said this, I've said in many conferences, and I'll keep saying it again. Those contracts are not negotiated by international bodies. They are negotiated with Africans on the table. If we do not understand our strategy, understand our work, we will still have to place in the peace in the Security Council. We'll have to place at the IMF. We'll have a representative in the, all, all the bodies, all the bodies that are calling the shots. And that representative will continue to be a perfect leader for the West. That is what our problem is. As long as we do not understand this, as long as we do not understand that we have people who do not understand that we can do our own things and be independent by ourselves and call the shots, that we have to depend on some Western leader to do every single thing, telling you the trends will not be in our favor. Until we have a Paul Kagami, we have a Thomas Sankara, we have you know, leaders that will stand up and say we are negotiating on equal basis and not as, you know, like Yulia said or somebody, some inferiority complex that come into play that we think that we must take from the West in order to be who where we are today. No, we are coming to the table at equal partners. We have the cocoa, we have the Arabica, we have this, we have that. We are negotiating on those terms that we are partners. When we're transferring technology, transferring our natural resources and their transferring technology to Africa. My colleague talked about the new finished product, food and farm, but on what negotiating track? If we do not understand that, the trend will not be in our favor. So to end it all, let's know what we have, our wealth, and negotiate equal techniques, not masters and servants, not with some inferiority complex, not thinking that we cannot use our own brain to do our solve our own problem. We can do it. They are glaring examples all over the African continent of presidents that have stood up and they have been able to make a difference. Even with or without us, we can do it and I believe we will do it. Indeed, we can do it. Uh, it is time to make a difference, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Enwako. Thank you so much. Uh, we, uh, of course, it was an interesting one, but then we have to put an end uh, to the, the program, hoping to have you all uh, sometime uh, soonest to continue to talk uh, uh, on these very topical issues that are affecting the global world, affecting the blessed continent, Africa. I I acknowledge you all. Uh, uh, we were joined uh, this day uh, by Yulia Burke, who joined us from Russia. Uh, she is uh, a political scientist uh, and, of course, uh, joined uh, uh, by uh, uh, Clifton Ellis, who uh, joined her uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, Kingdom in his capacity as a, a geostrategist, geopolitical analyst, and also uh, electrical power engineer and uh, Mr. Enwaku as uh, a researcher with Leeds University 
on African development. I appreciate all your efforts to be with me this day to discuss and give more understanding to the happenings around the world. And we continue to trust the Pan African television to relay the right information and, of course, uh, to uh, bring about uh, the positive changes uh, that the world needs in uh, this very turbulent moment, acknowledging also uh, the uh, uh, assistance of the technical crew uh, that ensured that we had a smooth uh, program. Thank you all. And of course, uh, keep trusting the Pan-African television for news is always on the move. Bye-bye and see you some other time. Afrique Média, le monde, c'est nous.